Everything that needs to be said about Niccolo Machiavelli's little book, The Prince, has already been said. What this video will do differently than other videos on the same topic is to put Machiavelli not only in a historical context, but in the context of the history of evolving ethical thought. We're going to look at how Machiavelli compared to the ethical thought that preceded and followed him. By the time we're done, not only should you be able to conquer the surrounding territories in the name of Rome, you should also have a rich understanding of which ethical systems you had to completely abandon in order to be a devotee of Machiavelli. Niccolo Machiavelli was born in 1469. England is involved in civil strife known as the War of the Roses. Switzerland is also in conflict. The Ottomans are expanding by claiming Greek islands and by besieging the region of Venice, Italy. It was an era of Game of Thrones. Gutenberg's printing press is only 20 years old. Popular reading in Europe outside of the Bible includes Thomas Akempis recently penned The Imitation of Christ. Leonardo da Vinci is 17 years old, and in this year, da Vinci's father buys a house in Florence, the city in which Machiavelli was born. In fact, Machiavelli would later help da Vinci get commissioned to paint a mural. The Spanish Inquisition begins when Machiavelli is seven years old. When he is 10, recurrences of the Black Plague kill hundreds of thousands in Venice. When he is 25, Charles VIII of France invades Italy and the Medici family is expelled from Italy and the Old Republic is restored. When he was 29, three friars would be tried and burned in a city square in Florence for challenging secular authorities in pursuit of reform. Around his 30th birthday, Machiavelli would find himself serving in governmental jobs as a secretary and a writer of government papers. He soon became a traveling diplomat. He then came up with the idea of building a militia in Florence made up of local citizens prepared to defend their land. Under Machiavelli's direction, farmers were turned into soldiers. These soldiers would take the city of Pisa in 1509. In 1512, the Medicis would take the city back torturing and expelling Machiavelli for one year. It was in 1513 that he would write The Prince, but it wouldn't be published until 1532, five years after his death. Machiavelli spent his retirement years writing a few successful plays, but more importantly, he wrote about politics. He would not in his lifetime see the success of the volume he had already published. The book wouldn't circulate for three decades before it was banned by the Pope. The Prince is a letter written to Lorenzo de' Medici, encouraging him to take Italy back using an army of Italian soldiers and to control it. The means by which Machiavelli encourages this behavior have been called evil by various generations of ethical scholars, all because the book encourages the Prince to do whatever it takes to ensure peace, including ruthless murder. Politically, the book is a break from political idealism, as we find in Plato's Republic. In such a work, the philosopher imagines an almost utopian vision of how a state could be run. Machiavelli has no such dreams. This is political realism, or portrayal of the ruthless means necessary of governing. Theologically, the book is a break from Christian virtues. While Thomas Akempis' imitation of Christ was widely popular at the time, encouraging people to practice the humility of Jesus. Machiavelli's work sees Christian virtues as something to be placed aside when they threaten the power of the ruler. I love my country more than my soul, Machiavelli wrote to Francesco Guicciardini. Ethically, the book is a break from everything that preceded it. Plato and Aristotle extolled virtuous living. Plato's Republic is an extended comparison between a virtuous state and a virtuous person. For the Greeks, the virtuous life, characterized by moderation, was the pathway to happiness. Subsequently, Jesus of Nazareth walked the earth and left a radical ethic of love, not only of one's neighbors, but of one's enemies. Quote, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also, Jesus said. Jesus prayed for the forgiveness of those who crucified him as he died. For a thousand years, if a European was educated, they read the Bible and they read Augustine. Augustine would develop an early just war theory, a theological defense of the moral permissibility of war given certain circumstances. This was seen as a compromise between Jesus' radical ethic to accommodate the responsibilities of government 
in keeping its people safe. Nonetheless, it was the stories of the early Christian martyrs that dominated Christian self-perception. For centuries, monks retired to monasteries to live peaceful lives. In Machiavelli's own day, Thomas Akempis wrote, quote, Be not angry that you cannot make others as you wish them to be, since you cannot make yourself as you wish to be. There was, among ethical thinking, a universal pursuit of an ideal of charity and kindness. Machiavelli's writings prioritize the peace of the state over any other standards of goodness, and they do so at all costs. In chapter 17, he writes, These reflections prompt the question, is it better to be loved rather than feared, or vice versa? The answer is that one would prefer to be both, but since they don't go together easily, if you have to choose, it's much safer to be feared than loved. We can say this of most people, that they are ungrateful and unreliable. They lie, they fake, they're greedy for cash, and they melt away in the face of danger. So long as you're generous and, as I said before, not in immediate danger, they're all on your side. They'd shed their blood for you. They'd give you their belongings, their lives, their children. But when you need them, they turn their backs on you. The ruler who has relied entirely on their promises and taken no other precautions is lost. Friendship that comes at a price, and not because people admire your spirit and achievements, may indeed have been paid for, but that doesn't mean you really possess it, and you certainly won't be able to count on it when you need it. Men are less worried about letting down someone who has made himself love than someone who makes himself fear. Love binds when someone recognizes he should be grateful to you. But since men are a sad lot, gratitude is forgotten the moment it's inconvenient. Fear means fear of punishment, and that is something people never forget. Elsewhere, he writes, what you have to understand is that a ruler, especially a ruler new to power, can't always behave in ways that would make people think a man good. Because to stay in power, he's frequently obliged to act against loyalty, against charity, against humanity, and against religion. Chapter 18. Philosophically, this is called consequentialism. This ethical system measures the worth of actions in terms of the consequences they produce. If the ends are good, the means are irrelevant. The ends justify the means, we say. There are different strains of consequentialism, many of which are still popular today. Utilitarianism, developed by Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill in the 19th century, says that behaviors are morally good if they contribute to the greatest overall happiness in the world. Egoism is another form of consequentialism, one which prioritizes the self instead of the world. Actions are best which most benefit me. Machiavelli's is a political consequentialism in which the peace of the state governs all else. Certainly consequentialism existed as a form of reasoning before Machiavelli, but he is the first to recommend it wholesale and without apology as the right thing to do. Critics of consequentialism often point out three weaknesses. First, it abandons the dignity of the individual. Often our moral instincts tell us that using a person as a means to an end is wrong and that everyone deserves fair treatment. Consequentialists disagree, and Machiavelli certainly disagrees. Several rulers historically have been so drunk on power and paranoia that they have had their own children executed, and this is the kind of consequentialism to which Machiavelli would assent. Second, consequentialism can be criticized because it is hard to predict the outcome of one's actions. It's fine and good to say that the moral worth of an action depends on its consequences, but we can't, at the time of the action, calculate exactly what the consequences will be. Machiavelli is simply pragmatic about this and says that while half of our results may be the result of fortune, the other half is still in our control. Thirdly, we can press further into why exactly the standard of goodness that makes a consequence good is actually that standard. Why is the peace and unity of the state the ultimate good? Why not the peace and unity of the entire world? Why not the love of humanity whose peace he seems to want to secure? Machiavelli takes his goal as the logical and necessary goal of a ruler. He's creating a hypothetical imperative rather than a categorical one. If you want a peaceful and unified country, then here is how to attain it. 
Subsequent ethical philosophers did not discuss Machiavelli at great length, relegating him to the realm of political philosophy rather than ethics strictly. Immanuel Kant would create a radical alternative to both Machiavelli and Jesus, seeking to find an ethical principle in a rational necessity alone. Bentham and Mill would revisit consequentialism, but with a happier end game in mind, the overall happiness of humanity. It tended to be the politicians and tyrants who enjoyed Machiavelli the most. Machiavelli has been widely read by politicians and philosophers from his day to ours. Catholic and Protestant kings read it as they conspired against one another. The Founding Fathers of America read it and John Adams spoke highly of it. Napoleon took copious notes on it. Frederick the Great of Prussia wrote a treatise against it. Stalin annotated his own version of it. Mussolini wrote a discourse about it. The Lord Jesus is still disappointed in it. Machiavelli's contributions to ethical thought are powerful and provocative. Most everyone rejects them as a matter of principle, but it should be no surprise that he is still widely read today, and there are a number of easily identifiable politicians who seem to stay true to him. As always, I'd recommend that you read the original source material itself. A short little video is not a substitute for reading Machiavelli in his own words. His writings are incredibly readable today, and if you know them well, they will inform your perceptions of the modern political scene. As politicians lie and cheat, or tyrants conquer smaller countries, Machiavelli's spirit lives on. And you and I will have to decide for ourselves whether or not we think consequentialism is the right way to approach moral decision making. It has its appeals, but also some grotesque costs. Hope that helps encourage your philosophical thinking. God bless.